watch and learn. Then. <laughs> Some things never change. Sweetie, darling, this is my missy here, sweetie. My missy. You've been a fantastic mother. You've let them ruin your figure. Oh, sweetie, darling, let me in. <laughs> sweetie, darling, let me in. The return of Absolutely Fabulous starting with the first ever episode next Thursday at 9.30 on BBC One. Question Time follows in an hour here on BBC One after Nick Ross and Jill Dando have appealed for your help once again in Crime Watch UK. Good evening, and first, before our reconstructions tonight, a direct appeal from the detective looking for the mother of the baby abandoned at Heathrow Airport this week. Timothy Ian was found by a passenger on Monday concealed in a bin in women's toilets in Terminal 4. He was put there sometime between half past one when the bin was last emptied and 3 p.m. when he was discovered. Were you in Terminal 4 last Monday afternoon, especially near gates 4 or 5? Remember these toilets were in the departure lounge, they were airside. Did you see any woman looking ill or distressed? The baby had been sort of crudely wrapped in a plain white plastic bag and was only an hour old. He has blonde hair, blue eyes, and he weighs a little over seven pounds. Alan Garrett, you've had a lot of publicity for this already. How can Crow much viewers help? Well, the impression that's been given is uh, rather one of a child that's been found. And of course, uh, the, the, the child is now thriving. But the difficulty is that the child was in fact dumped. And of course, the person that responsible may be more readily identifiable than may have, the public may have been led to believe so far. Uh, someone in a panic, someone in, in deep despair. It was actually just dumped, tipped upside down into a bin full of dirty nappies and heaven knows what. And things That's correct, yes. So you think that she would have been identifiable to people who were in the terminal at the time? Yes, a, a person who had been passed through childbirth without medical care, um, needed medical attention, a person who had been in deep distress, heavily traumatised and may now deeply regret what has occurred. Now given that this was in the departure lounge, Surely the likelihood is that she's not in the country now, nor most of the witnesses that you want to trace. That, that may be true, but there, there are three scenarios that could, could have occurred. One, a person departing from Heathrow, leaving the country on a flight from Terminal 4. The second is, is more complex of a transit passenger who has uh, passed through the controls and may not have in fact uh, be staying in uh, Heathrow. They're passing through, so they, changing planes. So this woman could have been in Terminal 1, 2 or 3? Exactly. The third alternative, of course, is a member of staff at Heathrow. How, how old was the baby when it was found? Do you know, was it born in the toilets? It was certainly, there was certainly no evidence to suggest that it was born in the toilets. In fact, I don't know where the, where the child was born. Okay. But uh, the, the uh, situation with, with regard to, to, the, to the toilets is that they're, they're, in pop, uh, they're very popular. They're in, in constant use. Someone must have seen the, the, this person. Okay, and obviously... The mother, whoever she is, needs help. If you know anything at all, please call us. If you're interested in adoption, though, please don't. Not here in the studio. We only need to hear from you if you were at Terminal 4 on Monday afternoon this week or in any of the other terminals where you saw something that could help with this inquiry. If you like, you can call officers at Heathrow Airport. They're on 0181 897 1212. That's 0181 897 1212. Now for news of cases we've featured in the past. As you may have heard, a man has been charged with the murder of Vicky Thompson, the Oxfordshire housewife who was attacked while walking her dog last August. A local man was suggested by Crime Watch viewers. Well, his name was already in the police inquiry system and he's now in custody awaiting trial. So are two youths who were identified by viewers after seeing our appeal about a violent attack in London's Marylebone station. Between them, they've been charged with GBH, robbery, resisting arrest and assaulting a police officer. 
And as a direct result of other Crime Watch appeals, five viewers identified a man who's since been charged with three counts of theft. Finally, as you'll have heard, a man is facing trial for the murder of the French hitchhiker Céline Figard, though his arrest wasn't as a direct result of last month's programme. This now is one of the cruelest crimes we have ever covered. The victim of a burglary was left callously and tightly tied up for a week and a half to die. It started on of all times Christmas Day when crime is almost non-existent, yet two break-ins happened within a few yards of each other off the high street in London's Camden town. Oh, this is great. Did you make it yourself, Kat? This is the camera set up. <laughs> Looks beautiful. beautiful. Face the camera. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, thinks he's a court photographer. How are we looking? <laughs> Alan Holmes lived by himself on Parkway, one of the main roads through Camden. He'd moved over from Northern Ireland 32 years ago and worked as a garage attendant at Kentish Town Police Station. He was a private man but had lots of friends, including the Horgan family, at whose house he spent Christmas. For you. You want some milk, Julie? Oh, you're embarrassing me. I didn't know we were giving presents. <laughs> Don't be so silly. Look, I'll open it later, all right? No, go on, open it now. Let's see what we've got, then. <laughs> Great. Thank you. It's so bloody cold in your place. At 11.10 on Christmas night in Camden High Street, around the corner from Alan's flat. I think we better get down to Collins. The front door's out. It feels like a bright one. UK receiving 809. Leave that for now. Take Alan home first to it when we get back. Oh. There's a guy inside, I think. You take the left, I'll take the right. There you go, Neil. You... There. There. I've got Guns him. I've got back. him. Dump at the back. I can hear them. You all right? Yeah, I've got him. A helicopter was called in with thermal imaging equipment to scan the rooftops, but the burglar wasn't found. This will do fine. We'll take you to the door. No, honestly, I, I need a walk after all that food. Good night, Pat. Oh, good night. Mm. Happy Christmas, Alan. Merry Christmas to both of you. Yes. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.
remember this man because he seemed to have tried about four or five times to get money out, as if he was trying different numbers. He was very calm about it, despite it taking a couple of minutes. I'd say he was about 22 to 25, six foot one, slim athletic bill with short cropped hair, a number two cut. He wore a light grey hooded top, like a sweatshirt type, and blue denim jeans, and he was wearing sand-coloured Timberland boots. He was always out and about, so it wasn't unusual for him not to not to be there. Just just the idea of him suffering when I was trying to contact him it seemed so cruel. It just it's something idle. I think it'll haunt me for the rest of my days. At the Shell building on the South Bank in London, Alan's card was used in the Lloyd's cash till seven times. Any sign up in the windows? No, no sign. He's on the second and third floors. I think I get long enough. Let's put the door in. Yeah. He's alive. I just couldn't bear the idea that he wouldn't pull through. But I'm afraid he died the following morning at 11 o'clock. I lost not only my brother, but a, my dearest friend. Very close. The horror of how Alan died is frankly not suitable for broadcast. John Yates, perhaps we should make it clear, first of all, that when there was the break-in at Cullen's, the supermarket, and one man was arrested there, you're pretty sure that he had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with this murder. That's correct. He's been completely eliminated from the murder inquiry. Yeah. So the, one sort of burglary was happening and someone else was in looting as well, That's and had then sort of escaped round the back. And went, why did they choose Alan's flat? Well, it was the only occupied flat in that block. Um, the, plot, the block's been redeveloped at the moment, and uh, that was the only flat that was occupied. Now, how can our viewers help? What can they do? Well, there's a number of areas that we're looking for help. Um, first is the, is the man who you saw uh, on the film, who drew the police's attention to the burglary. Um, he may not know it, but he may have some very useful information that could help this inquiry. Just to quickly reiterate, he's a man in his mid to late 20s, wearing a brown leather jacket, he wore a red top and he had a scarf and he was there at about 11.15 on Christmas night. Okay, now he was helping, we're not he was helping, absolutely, he's in any yes, way involved in this. Absolutely, right. Okay. Now, beyond that, what time could people have seen the man who actually did it? What time would he have left Alan's flat? Well, we're looking for anybody who was round about the Camden Town Tube Station area um, in the, uh, the late evening of Christmas Day and the early hours of Boxing Day, right up until the Tube Station opened round about 8 a.m. that morning. This link with the South Bank and the Shell Centre where he was using the Lloyd's uh, cash till, do you, do you see any link there? Is that significant? We're looking for help in shedding some light on this link between the, the Shell Centre on the South Bank next to Waterloo Station. Does our, does our individual live, live there? Does he travel or work there? There's definitely a link between the South Bank and Camden Town. We're looking for help to shed some light on that. What was taken apart from his wallet, his, his cards? We have some silver photo frames. Um, I emphasise the, the picture you see is a computer-generated enhancement, it's not an exact one, and they're about five inches by four inches. There's two of them, they've been in the family for some generations. Have you bought these or have you been offered them and bought them unwittingly? Okay, they'd be over 100 years old then. They would be, yeah. Presumably he wouldn't have kept this to himself, or would he? What do you think? 
Well, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a it's an appalling crime. It's it's it's. It's difficult to imagine the, uh, the, the dreadful circumstances in which Alan died. And I've just asked finally to people to focus on this point. Alan was tied up for 10 days, and during that 10 days, uh, his bank account was milked of approaching £1,000. It's inconceivable, I think, that the man or the individual responsible hasn't boasted or bragged about this to his friends, his family, or even his associates. We want their help now in bringing this man to justice. Thank you very much. Please don't hesitate to call if you can help. Here's our number in the studio, 0500 600 600. That's a free call number. Please don't let this dreadful, dreadful crime go unresolved. Here's the incident room number if you prefer to call that. So that's on 0181 733 6257. 0181 733 6257. Now, road rage has become a catchphrase. Usually it means verbal abuse or drivers making vulgar signs at one another. Sometimes, of course, it's dangerous with drivers deliberately swerving or going too close. On rare occasions, there has been physical violence, but in this case, though it's hard to believe, it led to murder. Three weeks ago, in the early hours of Friday, February the 9th, 39-year-old Peter Swales was travelling with his sister Linda and brother-in-law David Reed in Fitzwilliam, which is a small village near Pontefract. Well, Linda is now here in the studio. Linda, thank you for coming in. I know the memories are very raw and very recent for you. It was a tragic end to what had been an otherwise happy day, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. We had such a good day that we decided to go out at night time. So we went out and we ended up at a nightclub laughing and we had a drink and a dance. And then we were on our way home, playing Elvis in car and singing. And then this car just pulled up and started flashing its lights, so our Peter and Dave got out of the car to have words with him, to ask him why. And everything seemed fine, they got back in the car, and then this bloke just came up to the car window and smashed it. And then Peter uh, got out? Our Peter were getting out of the car, and this bloke hit him over twice. <laughs> and when I got out, he went on the floor. And I cradled him in my arms, and we managed to get him to Pinderfields Hospital. And, and he it. had an operation, but he died two days later. But yeah. it was such a lovable, yeah. everybody loved him. Linda, I know, and thank you very much for coming yeah. in and telling us about that. We must find this man, obviously. Um, Peter Brian Steele, what do we know about this dreadful attacker? Well, he's in his 20s, he's six feet tall, he's slim. His dark hair and it's worn in a crew cut uh, style and he's a moustache and at the time I was wearing a, a black padded jacket, jeans and white trainers. What sort of car was he driving? It was in a dark coloured Maestro, possibly an MG and the location he was driving, the route he took and his accent, it's a local South Yorkshire accent, causes me to believe he's well est established in that area and he lives in, a, in or to the south of Fitzwilliam. Now this weapon he used was, was a very unusual shape, wasn't it? What was it? Yes, it, it's a baseball type shape but it's much thicker and the end is about 10 inches in diameter and it was wielded in a two-handed uh, fashion. Now, road rage seems not strong enough a term to describe this attack, does it? No, I won't accept road rage. For me, we have to look at the facts. Peter was safely in the car, he was about to drive away when he was cruelly attacked with a, a deadly weapon. It was cold-blooded murder. We need help to detect this crime. If anybody has any information whatsoever, I urge them to help us and contact us straight away. Thank you very much. And Linda, thank you. Well, you've seen, obviously, the, the, the effect it's had on the family and on friends. Now, if you've heard anyone discuss this or any suspicions as to who this is, please do call. The driver is in his 20s. He's roughly six foot tall. Here's the number. We have 40 lines in the studio, but if you prefer to call the incident room direct, that number is 0800 318 001. That's a free phone number, 0800 318 001. And now with some striking pictures from security cameras, here's Superintendent David Hatcher. In fact, the first case involves a man we've seen before. In November, we showed him in Wiltshire, so he's obviously quite unfazed by going on TV. He's now been caught on camera several more times, and someone must know who he is. He might just have got married, for he's taken to wearing a wedding ring. Here he is in a bank in Leek in Staffordshire, but he's been using stolen credit cards and cheque books all around the country. He may well have been stealing them as well. 
He's caused a lot of grief, so ring us and let's stop him tonight from causing any more. Or call officers in Staffordshire on 01785 232 586. That's Stafford 232 586. Now this is not a vicar, but he's trying to draw money from a vicar's bank, private bank account. He's in the Nat West in Peckham Rye, South London. The bank seems to have a queuing problem, but that's not all. The man walked off with a large sum of someone else's money. As if that wasn't enough, six days later, here he is doing it all over again. This time the manager warned him to be careful with so much cash. Who is he? 500 600 600 is the studio number, or you can contact the robbery squad on 0171 732 1212. That's 0171 732 1212. And out of central Milton Keynes, on Friday the 1st of December, a man was seen loitering around the car park outside the council offices there. He's white, he's 5 feet 10 inches tall, with a very distinguishable tattoo. Well, I was walking towards my car and I saw this guy, he's just hanging around the other cars. He looked odd because he had a short sleeve jumper on, it was cold. So as soon as I got in my car, I locked the door because I felt a bit uneasy about it. And then he came up to the car, I couldn't believe he was actually going to try and get in. And he tried the handles and initially I was just really angry and I shouted at him to go away. And then he pointed down um, at something and I'm sure he was trying to get me to think there was something wrong with the tyres. She managed to drive away, but only 15 minutes later, in the same car park, this young woman wasn't so fortunate. It was my 21st birthday the next day, and I'd just popped to the city centre of my lunch hour to do some shopping. I was just about to get out of my car when the door opened and the man got in. I'll never ever forget the first words that he said to me. Don't get out, just drive. Um, he'd only been in the car for about two minutes when I asked him whether he was going to hurt me and he said no I won't hurt you just do as I say and you'll be all right we then drove through Milton Keynes while I was on the main roads I was I felt quite safe because I knew there was no way we'd stop or anything so there's nowhere to pull off I got the impression that he knew the area because he could give me directions in advance for where he wanted me to go. He, he knew what he wanted. He knew exactly where he wanted to go and what he was doing. When we turned off the main road, it was the point that I became really afraid as we turned into the woods. I, I knew that that was our destination. and He got me where he wanted to. So I said, please don't hurt me. If you want money, I'll get you money. If you want me to take you somewhere, I'll take you somewhere. So just do as I say. You, you don't know what's going to happen. I thought he was going to kill me. The assault itself was so totally disgusting and degrading. I can't even tell my family or my boyfriend what happened. It's something I can't come to terms with myself. He told me that he was dying of cancer and how desperate he felt. He mentioned that he was a second husband of somebody and he had two stepdaughters about my age. And things were just getting too much for him. Despite her terrible ordeal, the victim bravely agreed to return her attacker to the car park in Milton Keynes. As he got out, he then said, is there anything I can do to make amends for what I've done? I told him to stay out of my life. He's come into my life and hurt me and my family and taken something away. But yet he's out there every day, living his life, being with his friends and his family. That's the thing I can't cope with. Mm. Well, Tony Scott, if we believe what this man said to his victim, he seemed to give quite a few clues to his identity, didn't he? Yes, he did. He spoke at length about the illness that his 
um, he has got, uh, he used complex medical terms to describe this. He also spoke at length about his family. He stated he had um, a brother he hasn't seen for 20 years. He has uh, two stepchildren and two children from a previous marriage. Um, he spoke of all of these matters for quite a long time. But of course he could be bogus, all this could be false. Yes. The victim believed that when he was saying this, uh, that he was talking genuinely. But at the end of the day, we must take into consideration that he could be lying. Another thing we do know about him is that he's a smoker. What does he smoke? Yes, he smokes Benson and Hedges uh, Super Kings, and that's a red packet. So what did he look like? Well, he's a white male, aged about 45, 55 years old. He's 5 foot 10 inches tall, quite a stocky build, and he's got very short grey white hair, almost a crew cut that's just growing out. Um, he has a tattoo on his right forearm which is of a dagger. Uh, it's a faded tattoo but there's a ribbon or a scroll running through the dagger. Now let's just have a look at the trousers he was wearing on the day. This is a similar pair. Yes, uh, this is a, it's a light grey pair of jogging trousers he's wearing on the day with the words world famous down the left leg. And he's wearing these with a pair of white high-tech trainers and a short sleeve top, which is unusual because he's very cold that day. Now, this man, as we said, had been seen loitering around the council offices. He'd approached women in the past. Do you think there are other women who may have been approached by him who haven't come forward? That's very probable. Um, this person knew exactly what he wanted to do. We have to remember that he approached two women beforehand and tried to get into their cars. He wasn't going to give up. He was out to indecently assault somebody that day. Um, it's very likely he's done this before. He's a very confident man. He knew what he was doing. He's very calm. He's fully in control. Tony Scott, thank you very much. And there is a reward as well in this case. Yes, sir. Now, if you think you know this man, do call us here now or call officers direct in Milton Keynes. That's on 01908 686343. That's 01908 686343. Just tell you, among the uh, calls that we've taken, one has come in on. Uh, Baby Timothy Ian from the Director of Social Services at Hillingdon, of course, acting as guardian for the baby. And it's uh, an appeal from the Director, Julia Ross, who says, asked us to transmit this to the mother, if you're watching, please, please come forward. It's in the best interests of you and in the best interests of the child. What we're about to show you now is the unfolding of an unusual street robbery in South London, in Camberwell, last year. A student was walking home in the early hours of the morning when he was accosted by four youths. While he was being held, one of the men ran off with his cash card. Now you can see he hesitates outside the cash point, then tries another one round the corner. And now you can see the victim between two of the robbers. The boy in the check shirt appears to hand something to the victim. Now they're joined by yet another youth. This one here is in pale trousers. He seemed to be keeping a lookout. Finally, the fourth member of the gang joins them and he seems to be agitated. On several occasions, he appears to hit the victim in the back. Now, maybe you recognize the couple that are coming shortly. You'll see uh, the hooded youth who actually uh, stopped a couple. And if they did, and if you saw anything here, please call us. Now, any of those people, if you saw them, please give us a call, 0500 600 600 if you can identify them, or you can ring the officers direct at Walworth Police Station 0171 232 6146. 0171 232 6146. Now, his Detective Constable, Jackie Holmes. I have two appeals. First, about a man who's been stealing credit cards, or at any rate, has been swindling people with cards that have been stolen. Here he is at the NatWest Bank in Eastwood, Nottinghamshire, trying to draw cash. This was taken last April. More recently, in fact last month, he was seen twice in Yorkshire, again using stolen cards to obtain cash. You can see he's got quite a heavy build. Incidentally, he operates all over England, so do watch out for him. 0500 600 600 is the number here in the studio or call local police on 0121 643 8785. That's Birmingham 643 8785. My second appeal this month is about an attempted murder near Northampton. It started with an argument between two rival gypsy families and culminated in a man being shot at point blank range. 
This man, Samuel Willett, left the caravan site soon afterwards. He's aged 51, stocky, and is sometimes known as Samuel Lee. Since he's a traveller, he could be anywhere. We know he has relatives in Cambridgeshire, Bedfordshire, Hertfordshire, Warwickshire, Essex and all around London. He might also have a firearm, so please do be careful. 0500 600 600 or call officers in Northampton on 01604 703 925. That's 01604 703 925. Well, the phones have already been busy this evening, as we've heard. An air hostess has called saying that one of the passengers could have been the mother of baby Timothy. The Alan Holmes murder, uh, we've had a few calls suggesting people who may have been responsible for that. The connection between Camden and South Bank, we're told, is that both areas are used by skateboarders, so there may be a tie in there. Several names have also been suggested for the Oxford Street cash point man, and uh, on the Peter Swales murder, various suggestions have been given for the, the murder weapon used. But do call in, of course, if you have any, any clues, however tenuous you think they are, give us a ring here. Now let me tell you about uh, more of our results. We had 280 calls on our reappeal about Margaret Wilson. That was the murder on Humberside where two local tractor drivers watched in horror as a man ran up behind her in a lane and stabbed her. Now there were several suggestions about the knife we showed and new names have been suggested. The police say the response was quite phenomenal. Another big response was for this EFIT of a man who raped a boy in Bedfordshire. In fact, the sheer scale of the reaction has meant the police now have 120 names to work through. Sussex police had much the same problem in their search for little Daisy Chillingworth, whose parents are travellers and who is thought to be at risk. Even so, do please call if you've seen her. And finally, the rape of the schoolgirl in Pontefract. I've come about bike for sale. Now this was the attacker. He drives a Vauxhall Cavalier or something similar. However, since last month, police have discovered that he used this payphone on the Manor Estate in Sheffield and another in Shelf. So can you link the face to those areas, please? Next, to two more faces. To two cars, a pair of handcuffs and a stolen helmet. Can you link any of them with Newmarket in Suffolk? Last month, two security guards were kidnapped in the town centre and their van was hijacked. Lots of shoppers saw part of what happened. It was on a Monday morning during the January sales, in fact, just before 11am on Monday the 15th. It started in the loading bay of Argos stores off Fred Archer Way. This man ambushed one of the guards as he was getting into his Security Express vehicle. He's between 30 and 40 with short, dark hair and his sunglasses said turbo on the arms. This is another member of the gang. He's early 20s, very thin, with ginger hair and what's described as a pasty complexion. He was waiting beside a distinctive car, a newish, bright red, probably Vauxhall Cavalier. Now that was in Hammond Close. There may have been a black Golf GTI involved as well. The robbers left behind these handcuffs, and please only call about them if you can match them with the faces. Alternatively, have you found a helmet like this, because one was taken in the raid. 0500 600 600 is the number to call or you can ring the officers direct in Suffolk 01284 774 444 that's 01284 774 444 now here's superintendent David Hatcher this is a peculiar case a man who's had an apparently unblemished career for nearly 20 years yet disappeared at the same time as a large sum of money vanished from his company's safe he's Gerald Reed Clayton and he used to be the assistant manager of a large retail store in Liverpool city centre. He and the cash were last seen just after Christmas. Curiously, an even larger sum of money was left behind. Please call 0500 600 600 or contact the local police on 0151 777 4065. That's Liverpool 777 4065. Now this is Trevor Hoos. If you're watching Crime Watch in a pub, it's just possible he's served your drink. We know he's worked in lots of pubs. And a lot of someone's money disappeared and Mr Hoos may be able to explain what happened to it. He's 36, tall, with fair hair. 0500 600 600 or contact police in Solihull on 0121 712 6010. That's 0121 712 6010. On the face of it, murder is the worst crime you can get. But in Annex case, someone not only murdered, 
but then tried to cover up the evidence, set fire to a flat in a block in which some 55 people were asleep. This is St Mary's in Walthamstow, East London, and Joy Hewer went there every week. She retired early as a school teacher and devoted all her energies to church work. She helped run soup kitchens, do office work, and volunteered for cleaning. Hi Joy, how are you this morning? I'm exhausted. Joy would very simply have said that her life centred around Jesus. That was her life, and it was expressed by involvement in churches. When you arrive as a new vicar in a parish, uh, as I did uh, in July 94 here at St Mary's Walthamstow, um, some people uh, avoid you because they think you're busy settling in or they, they think the vicar's too important to come and call on. But one of the very first persons to call on me was Joy Hewer. He said, I just want to welcome you to Walthamstow, and you and your family, and say how pleased we are that you've come. Uh, and she had a bunch of flowers to give us. She had a big grin all over her face and just said, it's so nice to have you. And uh, off she went. One of the churches that Joy attended on a regular basis over the last two or three years was the London Healing Mission in Notting Hill Gate in West London. It was an important part of her life and she went there every Tuesday and Thursday regularly. She attended meetings there, I believe, on those days and also helped out with some of the administration connected with the church. That evening, Tuesday, October the 17th, Joy got home about six o'clock. The couple living two floors beneath her were also home that evening. I'm back! Oh, your mum called. How long ago? Just now. Okay. Upstairs, Joy was staying in and was also on the phone. Hello, Steve. Oh, Tim. Is your dad there? When will he be back? Can you tell him I called? and ask him to give me a ring back. It's nothing terribly important, um, but I'll be in all night if he wants to give me a call. Lovely. Thanks. Bye. I remember that I had a bad stomach, so I went to bed around 10 o'clock, and my boyfriend went with me, and he fell asleep nearly straight away. About 10.30, I was woken by lots of banging noises, crashing furniture being thrown around or something. And I was a bit worried because the flat above was empty and I thought somebody might have broken in there. Carried on for at least five, ten minutes. After I went quiet, somebody started running downstairs really fast. Heavy feet. Must have been a heavy person. Sometime after 10.30, a motorist on Forest Road almost collided with a man sprinting from St David's Court. Did you see something too? Another motorist, a good Samaritan, may be a further crucial witness. Was this you? Hello, you know the junction, um, uh, it's in E17, yeah? Walthamstow. St David's Court, a block of flats, is it a junction? Yeah. yeah. I was just driving past there and I saw like flames coming out one of the, one of the um, floors. I'm not sure what floor it is, but I just saw it and I thought, well, I'd better just... Uh, yeah, so when you say it's at the junction, what's it at the junction of? Hold on, let me ask someone. Excuse me, do you know the name of this street? What? Yeah, it's um. Yeah. Yeah, Walthamstow Town Hall is in the um the junction of Wood Street. I think it's Forest Street. The Forest other Street. One. Okay, we're on our way. Yeah. Okay then. Uh, does that come up? Yeah, we're on our way now. Yeah. Okay then. All right. Bye. Bye. And who was the helpful man at the bus stop? Um, we had no idea if anyone was involved in the fire. There were obvious signs of smoke on the lobby, so we had to move quite fast. When Farman found Joy, she was already dead. She'd been stabbed. Can you imagine what it's like from a parent's? 
I mean, my parents are both very elderly now. They're not too well. For, you, for parents to see a child die in any circumstance before they go is pretty catastrophic. But for it to happen in this way is just totally devastating. And they told me that, you know, what they dread is waking up each morning and just having to face it all over again because it just doesn't get any easier. It just goes on and on and on. John Arthur, the main suspect just has to be the man running out of the flats in David's Court across the road. Yes, indeed. We are very anxious to trace the individual that ran across the road sometime after 10.30. Uh, he's quite distinctive. He's black. He's very thin, very tall. Six foot four, in fact, the witness has described him as. Um, he ran very fast from the steps of the flat into the road. In fact, a motorist had to take evasive action, otherwise there would have been an accident. Now, six foot four, that is very, very tall. Yes, Perhaps it is. Perhaps fewer than one in 200 men are going to be that, that big. Obviously, when you're driving, you're looking up at somebody. Maybe he looked bigger than he really was, but he's certainly tall. He, he was thin. six foot four because the, the witness has been seen, and yes, I'm happy with that description. Now, there was another man you need to, not so much eliminate, but a potential witness who was there some hours earlier, three or four hours earlier. That's right. We've been fortunate. We've actually traced the majority of people that were at the flat on that day. However, at 6.35, a white man was seen at the flat by the lifts talking to a young couple that were bringing furniture into the flat. And he is described as being, he's white, he's 21, 24 years of age, five foot seven tall. He's well spoken with a southern accent and he has a boyish face. I don't believe he may be in, uh, involved in the, uh, in, the, in the investigation, but we need to eliminate him. Now, I've been to the flat. Joy had a, a spy hole. She could see people who were outside, and she was certainly dressed in her night attire when the, she answered the door. I mean, it must have been someone she knew, or presumably it was someone she knew, she let in. Well, that's right, Nick. I, I am of the opinion that she knew the person that actually uh, came into the flat that night and actually killed her. She was a cautious person, we know that from our investigation. She would use the uh, stairs rather than the lifts. She would use the British Rail stations rather than underground when travelling to London. So in my opinion, she would not have allowed anybody into that flat unless she knew who that so individual was. So you need was. to know everybody who knew Joy or who knew every, just any pieces of the jigsaw that you can bring together about her life and who she knew? That's absolutely right. So at the moment is a motiveless crime. We need to hear from all people that, that knew her in order that we can ascertain a background and uh, there certainly she attended various churches one was the london healing mission and we would like to hear from uh, present members and past members uh, if they can help us with this investigation and offered yeah, thank you uh, very much indeed 0800 600 600 uh, if that's busy then you can try the instant room on 01 81 345 4351 that's 0181 Three four five four three five one. Now to a man who must be caught soon. He's responsible for a serious assault on a schoolgirl in Gillingham in Kent. Now he called at her house in the afternoon of Friday, the 19th of January. He's in his early 20s, about five feet eight inches tall. He's slim with brown cropped hair. It's possible he was in the area for several hours that afternoon. So if you saw him or if you know who he is, please call. 0500 600 600 is our number, or if you prefer the incident room in Maidstone, that's 01622 654321. That's 01622 654321. Members of the public often act with a courage that surprises even themselves. As a result of one of these occasions, an armed robbery was foiled. I can't give you the details because one man is already charged with the offence, but this man may be able to help when the case comes to trial. He's Brian Anthony McShane. He's 28, average height, and has a tattoo of a dolphin on his left forearm. So if Mr McShane is watching, or if you know where he is, call the officers at the Flying Squad on 0171 407 6319. That's 0171 407 6319. And finally, this man who sought in connection with serious sexual offences. The victim was a young man with learning difficulties. Anthony Shandley was a pub and club entertainer some years ago and was well known on the Blackpool club scene. He's 42, very short, about 5 foot 3, and usually wears a trilby hat. His stage name was Terry Shannon, and he's described as seeming honest and outgoing. But where is he now? Please call the Family Protection Unit in Blackpool on 01253 745 205. That's 01253, the code for Blackpool, 745 205. 
Just looking at the calls that are coming in on Peter Swales, which was, if you like, called Road Rage, though the officer investigating the case said it was cold-blooded murder, we've really got some names and one quite interesting one which comes from the area where the murder took place. On the Milton Keynes kidnap we've got two names uh, which the officers are really very interested in indeed and incidentally it looks like we've got three other women coming forward who've also been attacked in similar circumstances. The credit card fraud so there's uh, one name where a woman caller says she's made an absolutely positive identification she's certain of it. We've got lots of other names for lots of other cases as well. Jill. Finally, before we go, here's a reminder of some of the faces we've shown. Now, all these men used stolen credit cards. Do you know any of them? Or any of these? The man top left is Brian Anthony McShane. Where is he? Next to him, Samuel Willett. He's wanted for attempted murder. Bottom left, Gerald Reed Clayton. Why did he disappear? And next to him, Trevor Hoos. Now, if you know where any of them are, call us now. That's all for this month. We're back with Crime Watch Update here on BBC One in an hour's time at 11.50. Our lines are open until midnight. Other numbers are available on CFAX on page 614. And if you've information on any crime we haven't featured tonight, then do call Crime Stoppers. They're on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. That's 0800 treble 5 treble 1. And if you can't stay up until 10 to 12, well, who can blame you? But we'll be back a month from now. And until then, don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Only one month ago, Scotland were being written off. Now, just one team stand between them and the glorious Grand Slam. Can England raise their game to spoil the tartan party? Or will Murrayfield be the scene for a triumphant Scotland? Live coverage of Scotland versus England begins Saturday in Grandstand on BBC One and on BBC Radio. This weekend in the Sculptress, someone's telling lies. You get used to being seen as a monster. Sometimes I even believe it myself. Do you know what she really wants you to tell her? What it feels like to kill someone. If she publishes that book and Olive gets out, we are all finished. You did kill your mother and your sister, didn't you? The Sculptress continues this weekend on BBC One. David Dimbleby is in the chair once again now on BBC One for Question Time. On Question Time tonight from Norwich, Home Office Minister Anne Widdecombe. Shadow Education and Employment Spokesman David Blunkett. Liberal Democrat Chief Whip Archie Kirkwood. And Medical Research Director Bridget Ogilvie. Thank <laughs> you.